Good morning, everyone. Wow, y'all made it. Way to go. Way to go. I'm proud of y'all. Hey, before we get started, you know, we usually start with a psalm. I wanted to kind of cue this one up a little bit um, to, to help us um, receive it and say it and proclaim it um, with a very intentional way. So some of you may have come from a, a background in the church that sang this old song, Bringing in the Sheaves, which if you were a kid during that time, you would have said, I, I don't know what I'm singing. I don't know what a sheath is, or sheath in the singular. And yet we have in Psalm 126, this reference to sheaves, which would have been like the bundle of wheat that you were bringing in from the field. And the whole point of it is to proclaim that God has taken care of you. God has looked after you. And so we look to God, our Father, to take care of our every need. And when he does, we wanna recognize it. We want to proclaim it and thank him and be grateful for that. And so even in this morning, as we say these words from Psalm 126, we have a whole year to think back on what God has done and what he's continuing to do in our lives and in our community. And would you stand as you're able, and we're gonna say these words together in Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. And here it is. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. And so with a grateful heart, let's sing to God our Father this morning. And the mountains in 
We celebrate the third week of Advent by lighting the candle of joy. As we pray this morning, your responses will be in bold on the screen. Jesus, we pray that the Holy Spirit would keep forming our lives and relationships into your image. Lord, fill us with the presence of God, that our joy might be complete as we find every desire met in you alone. This Advent, Prepare room in our hearts to fully receive Christ as we were created to. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those here who have recently lost loved ones or even lost relationships. We acknowledge the pain, burdens, and journey of lament. While we long for deep joy, there is grief which can only be redeemed in your good hands. May our Lord Jesus, who overcame death, fill the hearts of those who mourn. We pause here and invite you to pray on behalf of those you know who are suffering and grieving great loss. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love to the hardwood of the cross so that all might reach your saving embrace. As you have called us to be the church that lives into your image and loves for the sake of others, clothe us in your spirit, grow our ability to carry your joy, bring to people who do not know you before our eyes, and let your hearts in them be like yours. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord, in your mercy. At this time, we invite the children to follow the cross out to the kids' club. Come on.
Friends, on this uh, dark and rainy day, a song like that just seems to work. Um, it seems to kind of hit in all the right places. And as we wait on Jesus to return, things can seem pretty dark. I know that that resonates with me. I am going in the right spot right here, right? I didn't jump up where I wasn't supposed to. Okay, good. Um, Sometimes I get excited. See, the thing is, though, as we wait and we hope, um, we never have to wait alone. And we talk a lot about this. We're not praying for Jesus to come for the first time. Jesus has come. We are waiting in hopeful anticipation of Jesus returning. So we never have to wait alone. We need simply to ask Jesus into our waiting. So my question for you this morning is, and my question for me is, where can we invite Jesus in our waiting? Whether it's something we're struggling with, whether we're waiting to get past something, whether we're waiting to get past grief, whether we're waiting to get past something we are struggling with, where are we waiting this morning? Let's invite God into that and then we'll pray together. friends, if you'll join me in this prayer on the screen. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Through your son, Jesus, have mercy on us And forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. So friends, as we pray this, let's remember that we're not walking. We're not going through any of this alone. We're not walking alone. We're walking with Jesus as we wait with hopeful anticipation for his return to glory here on earth. And in that we can find peace. And we can share that with others. So I'm going to invite you to stand back up. Take a few moments as we say, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's take a few moments. Let's pass the peace of Christ. I'll call you back in a second. everyone even though it's see it seems like it's about six o'clock in the evening right now like the sun has just decided not to come up today good morning i'm so glad to see y'all it's great to be worshiping together on this dark and dreary day seems quite pertinent for advent in the season um, my name's Turner. If we hadn't gotten a chance to meet, if this, your, if this is your first time walking into St. Peter's on a Sunday, this is not what it typically looks like. So welcome. It's a great time to introduce yourself, to get to know some folks. I want to highlight a couple of things we have going on in our, in our church, in our community. It's a very busy time of year, as you all know. First up, we have a Christmas decorating day. This Tuesday, the 19th at 930, we're going to be meeting right here. Kids are welcome. We have a culinary team. Team who's going to create a nice little light breakfast for us. We'll have some coffee. We'll listen to some music. And we're going to decorate the space for Christmas. It's actually a whole lot of fun. It's not about decorating. It's about showing up and hanging out. It's a great place to get to know people. It's a great place to connect. So you're all invited to that. Then on Wednesday... We are going to create some space for worship. This is a busy time of year. I know I feel this to the point where when we decided we were going to do another seek service, I went, really? We're going to do something else? 
But what it's about is not doing something else. It's about taking some time and intentionally carving out some space for prayer and for worship. AJ and Martin are going to be leading us. We're going to sing some of those wonderful old Advent carols that we don't get to do nearly enough. So it's a great time if you want to just come and pray and worship or if you need some prayer for some healing in this time of year that can be really painful for some. This is a night for you, so I invite you to save that date and come and join us. And then, wow, Christmas Eve, right around the corner a week from today, we're going to be having three different services at 10 o'clock in the morning. It will be the final Sunday of Advent, and we don't want to skip over that. So we're going to have what will look a little more like a typical Sunday morning service at 10 o'clock, where we will, we will not skip over the last Sunday in Advent. And then at 3 and 5, we will have more of our traditional Christmas Eve services right in here. So come one, come all. It's going to be an amazing night. Last, certainly not least, December is traditionally a month where a large majority of our giving comes in that, that helps us throughout the year. So if you call this your church home, I'd like to invite you to join us in giving towards God's mission and vision for St. Peter's Church. There are a number of ways to do that. You can find all those online. Um, and also, I want to let everybody know, AJ is actually, we need to be praying for him. He's guest preaching at a church downtown today. I hope he took his canoe. Um, so we are fortunate enough to have uh, my beautiful bride, Margaret, preaching and teaching us today. So with that in mind, Marg, welcome. We're happy to have you. And I'd like to invite our reader forward as we continue in worship together. Our gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 56. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. 
He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. The word of the Lord. Courtney, thank you for that very long reading. I'm sorry it was long, but sometimes it's good to read the whole story. Um, my name is Margaret Merritt, as my husband mentioned. Um, if I haven't met you, it's a delight, and I hope I get to speak to you after the service. Um, before we begin, I want to pray. And today I want to borrow a prayer um, from Lectio 365, which is an app um, I use regularly, and they've been praying a beautiful prayer in Advent. And so I want to use that to set the tone for this um, conversation. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your spirit upon our preparation for Christmas. We who have so much to do seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people, walking in darkness, yet seeking the light. To you we say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. One week from tonight, we will gather in this room, at least those of us who are not traveling, and we will read the story of the birth of our Savior from the Jesus Storybook Bible, and we will light candles in joyful anticipation of the arrival of our Lord and Savior. But this week, we're still in Advent. Advent calls us, as AJ has talked about, to slow down the rush to Christmas morning and to look honestly at the darkness. I've really enjoyed a book by Tish Harrison Warner on Advent this season, and I especially love this quote. She writes, Advent asks us to name what is dark in the world and in our own lives and to invite the light of Christ into every shadowy corner. Before the delight of Christmas, Advent invites us to a vulnerable place. Only by dwelling in that vulnerable place can we learn to profess true hope, not a cheap hope spun by falsehood and half-truths, but a hope offered by the very light that darkness cannot overcome. But what is biblical hope? Hope is a word like many that has been cheapened over time. It's been watered down. We say things like, I hope I get what I want for Christmas. I hope my team wins. But this is a watered down version of what it is to truly hope. Christian hope is the confidence that God is faithful and that he will complete what he has begun. It is a hope that does not ignore the darkness, but does not allow us to be consumed by it as we live expectantly seeking the light. So how do we acknowledge the darkness yet live as children of the light as scripture calls us? We live in a time and culture that doesn't really give us a model for holding attention like that. But the great news is scripture is like a playbook of all the ways to live and many of the ways not to live, to be honest. Um, and today in our reading, we watch Mary as she shows us what it means to hope. She's in a moment where she says one of the hardest yeses to the living God in all of scripture. And she's a model for us in how we can walk this out. Before we get into her response, we need to acknowledge the darkness in Mary's life. Culturally, Mary was a part of the Israelites or the Jews. She was a part of a people group that from the very beginning of their story had been oppressed by one regime after another. They were currently being tyrannized by Rome. 
They were in a season of waiting, hopefully expectant for the Messiah. But in a period of time where the Messiah foretold by prophets long ago had not been spoken of by a prophet for 400 years. And then there were her personal circumstances. Mary's personal circumstances gave plenty of reason to be fearful. I love nativities. They're all over my home. These are three from my home specifically. Two from our nativities and one from an Advent book we read every night. I love them and they are beautiful, but I am not sure they give us an accurate picture of the true Mary. In these, she is clean and well-dressed, peaceful, and probably in her mid-20s or 30s. I think these girls give us a little bit more accurate picture of what Mary might have looked like. These are two young mothers, teenage mothers in Honduras, 12 and 14. And like Mary, they live in poverty. In a world where the powerful take advantage of the weak. There are women all over the world who can relate to the circumstances of Mary's life way more than we would care to admit. Furthermore, the potential response of the people in Mary's lives gave her every reason to be afraid. She lived in an honor-shame culture where to be found pregnant out of wedlock could mean that you were basically dead to the family that you had brought shame on and that you could quite literally be put to death as the penalty for adultery was stoning. So that is much of the darkness that surrounds Mary as we find her in this moment. She had plenty of reason to fear in her present circumstances. So how does Mary respond so magnificently, faithfully to this costly invitation from the Lord? If you have been a part of the St. Peter's community for long, you've probably heard AJ talk about rooting ourselves within the larger story of God's unfolding redemption for the Lord. It's a story of a God who goes to costly lengths to be in relationship with those he loves and who invites us, his people, into that story of the redemption of the whole world. It's an incredible story. And we see in Mary's response that she was very aware that she was a part of this larger story. Specifically, the portion of today's reading that is called Mary's Song, where she is in the home of Elizabeth and pours out praise in response to this invitation. In that passage, we see over 15 Old Testament readings. I'm not going to ask you to read this. We're not going to go into detail. But I just want to point out that on the right-hand side, I always get stage right and all that wrong. So anyway, on this side, um, (laughs) you see each verse of her response. And on that side, you see the Old Testament references that are drummed up in that. that As people look at it, and analyze it, they can see clearly how she is pointing back to the story of her ancestors. She was acutely aware. Deuteronomy tells the people of God to impress these stories, to impress this scripture on their children, to talk about them when we sit at home and when we walk along the road and when we lie down and when we get up. This is a command that her parents would have taken very seriously. Despite likely being illiterate, Mary knew the story she was a part of. As I read commentaries on her song, I was amazed to find in-depth analysis of how her story, her song points back to that of Miriam, the sister of Moses, as they leave Egypt. Or how there's almost a line-by-line correlation between her song and that of Hannah, the mother of Samuel, as she 
receives the gift of a long-awaited son. And the many, many direct references to the Psalms of David. Mary knew these scriptures so deeply, they were written on her heart, so that in a moment of crisis, what welled up from within her was the scripture, the story of God's faithfulness to his people, to her people, and the very words of her ancestors as they recounted that story. This is why we read and memorize scripture. Because over time, it becomes who we are. We find our place in that story. The Lord Lord uses this to generate hope within us. When we don't have the words to say, the words that have been written on our heart bubble up, just like with Mary. Mary not only knew the larger story, but she understood who the protagonist in the story is. Mary's song is often referred to as the Magnificat. And this is for the first word in Latin of the first line of her song. And in English it says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Instead of focusing on herself, her present troubles, or the glory that could be hers as the mother of the Messiah, Mary points us back to the Lord as the giver of all good gifts. She recognizes that it is by his grace alone that she is being invited into this story. This is a picture of true humility. And personally, I'll just say, as someone who struggles with the arrogance of self-reliance, and self-sufficiency, it's a relief. Remembering who the protagonist is in my own story takes a weight off. Our hope is in the Lord, not in ourselves. Finally, her song is a song of praise. Each Sunday in Advent, we light a candle Tonight, th- today is the candle of joy. This Sunday is often referred to as Gaudet Sunday. This is the, from the Latin translation, rejoice in the Lord always. To quote Tish again, the lighting of this candle is a reminder that things may look really dark in these short, late days of Advent. But hope is not lost. We have not been left alone in this sad world. Our king is indeed coming. A baby is on the way. This experience of God at Sunday, of lighting a candle of joy in the midst of the longest, darkest nights of the year, is the posture of all of our Christian life. So I want to give us something to reflect on as we move towards the communion table, and maybe even to carry with you throughout the week. One little side note that I wasn't planning on saying, but when Turner was announcing the Sikh service, I just want to point out that this response came when she entered the presence of Elizabeth. The Lord was the initiator, but he did use the presence of others in her community of faith to draw this song out. So, if you find a hard time rejoicing or you feel a need to press in, I would strongly encourage you to come on Wednesday night and worship together with your community of faith. But before we do that, I wanna give you something to reflect on. I wanna acknowledge that this week, In the lead up to Christmas, for many, is one of the hardest weeks of the year. For some, it's because of grief. We're walking into a season filled with memories and traditions, and the person you long to share that with is not here. For others, it's because of family strife. All this planning when you can't get along on a basic day. (laughs) 
Those conflicts are a part of what you're walking in this week. For others, it's just the anxiety of trying to live up to expectations you know you can never meet. Whatever it is, Mary shows us how to hope in the Lord. She shows us how to praise in the midst of very difficult circumstances. Despite our concerns and fears, how to praise him for his greatness. This week is not a call to ignore the darkness, to push it aside in false hope or cheap joy. That is not what you're being asked to do. You're being asked to invite the true light into that darkness, to illuminate it and to show you how to rejoice. So I'd like you to consider that during communion. What are the areas of darkness? Would you have the courage to name those honestly before the Lord and invite him to shape your view and your perspective and invite you into hope? So as we move to the communion table, I'd like to just offer a blessing from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Margaret connected for us that we are in the literal longest nights of the year. It's really hard to ignore the dark places in our lives when we are surrounded by physical darkness. And even this morning, we're sitting here and we keep referencing this morning as tonight, right? Like even tonight, it looks like so dark. And so I would reiterate what Margaret said just giving space for the Holy Spirit to expose where are the dark places? Where do we need hope? Sometimes the dark place is in grief. Sometimes the dark place is in sin. The Holy Spirit will certainly do the communicating on that part. But we bring both before the Lord that he might illuminate our lives and redeem them. And so friends, the good news this morning is that the Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Holy Spirit. Our Lord's death is a combination of grief and gladness, sadness and deep joy of realizing what Jesus had to go through, which is so hard, but that he did it for us and changed this world forever is a reason for us to proclaim hope and joy and peace. The very things that you call us to in this season. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and speak to us graciously? Thank you for making this for us spiritually, the body and blood of Christ that we might receive all your provisions, all your goodness today. Amen. My friends, we proclaim the mystery of our faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Would you stand as you're able? Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our communion servers can come forward. And <clears throat> as you come forward this morning, remember, we do have gluten-free. And if um, our kids do make it back in, if they're not receiving communion yet, our servers would love to pray a blessing over them this morning. Friends, come with the darkness ready to receive the light of Christ.
love the beautiful juxtaposition that we have right now when we are singing out this great, amazing truth and watching palm trees lose their minds outside. It is so good. I will say a couple of things. One, some of y'all did get the weather alert, so we are under flash flood warning, so you've heard from the stage now. Please be careful, be safe, take your time getting home. Secondly, I'd say, you know, based on just driving on Isle of Palms yesterday, I was looking around and just seeing these majestic oaks. And I know we put up with the, the leaves and the blossoms, blooms and all that stuff, so that we get the beauty of them, we get the shade, and we get the longevity. When we talk about being rooted this morning, that's what oaks do. They stand the test of time. That's what they do. We are followers of Christ. What we do is we root ourselves to the Holy Spirit and we bring all of it, all the hurts, all the darkness, but also our hope fully in him and receive his light. And so today as we go out, we, we are tempted to go out into darkness, but we go out into the light of the world, being carriers and bearers of that light as well. And so friends, please receive this benediction this morning. Let us go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit sent forth for the sake of the world. God bless y'all. Thank you.